What is the meaning of life? Well, we've been talking about that question for a long time now. And what we have said is that the whole meaning of life depends on the origin of life. It really matters whether we are just chance atoms thrown up by a mindless evolutionary system or whether, in fact, we are a planned, purposeful result of the activity of some intellect. And what we have been sharing over these few months is that there is a great deal of evidence in our world to suggest that we are not just the chance results of the explosion of certain atoms. We are not just the hazardous result of a series of evolutionary processes that have occurred without any guidance or out, without any plan. In fact, when we look at the seasons in our world and see how they fall so regularly year after year so that we can plan the growing of our crops by them, in fact, when we look at the incredible accuracy of the turning of the earth and its orbiting round the sun and realize that we set all our watches and clocks by its activity, when we see the faithfulness and the reliability with which the sun rises and sets each day, when we then begin to examine the chart of the elements and see how the atomic weights fit into a pattern that surprises us and enables us to tell where another element will be found even though we have not yet found it, when we study the DNA structure of the molecules and the basis of life itself, when we observe the amazing circulation of the blood and the beating of the heart, which we cannot yet explain, the more we enter into the incredible design and intricate purposefulness that we see in our world, the more we are drawn to the same conclusion as Einstein that there is an intellect that originally planned whatever evolutionary process may have brought about our existence or may not have brought about our existence, there has to have been an intellect behind it. And since we are persons, that intellect must be at least as personable as we are. We've also observed the fact that not only is there an incredible design and intricate purposefulness in the world, but we've seen too that we have, despite all our desire to be selfish, petty people who are always fighting our corner, we have discovered within ourselves a higher kind of desire that makes us want to be unselfish. Even though it's easier to be selfish, we want to be unselfish. Even though it's easier to be cowardly, we want to be courageous. And so we've seen inside ourselves another tendency that suggests that there comes from outer space to us certain standards of life that are higher than those that we naturally take to ourselves. And so because of the evidence of design and order in our universe and because of our own personableness and because of this sense of moral obligation that we have within us that keeps contradicting and making awkward all our failures, we have concluded that there is circumstantial evidence around us that there must be somewhere an intellect, a personal intellect, a supreme being of some kind that has been responsible for the origin of our world. Now, of course, we agreed that that evidence is circumstantial at this point. But then we asked the further question, was there any empirical evidence, any touch-and-see evidence? If there is such a supreme being in the universe and if there is such a supreme intellect that is responsible for our creation, has that intellect ever communicated with us in any way? And is there any empirical evidence that that has taken place? 
and we began to talk about the various religious leaders that have claimed to speak for this supreme being, and we found that they all fall into the same category of being ordinary human beings that died like the rest of us and were buried and were known no more, except for one remarkable human being that existed in the first century of our era. And he was a man that outshone all other religious leaders by the perfect purity and ethical perfection of his life. And he outshone them also by the intimacy that he implied that he had with the supreme being behind the universe. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, if you've worshipped me, you really worship the Father. And where all other great religious leaders were very careful to dissociate themselves from claims to divinity, this man said he was divine. And that even at pain of death even when he was being threatened with execution, he still said, yes, I am the son of the creator of the universe. He not only lived like the son of the creator of the universe, not only spoke like him, but he did something that no other religious leader ever did. He said that he would be crucified, would be executed, and then would come alive again after he was dead and would remain alive long enough to show us that he had the power to destroy death itself, and therefore to show us that he had the power to get off the earth and come back onto it whenever he wished, to go out into outer space to where his creator father was and to come back whenever he chose, and that he actually did. We have been examining the historical evidence that reinforces the incontrovertible conviction that this man did actually rise from the dead. And we're left, of course, with only the three possibilities that we talked of. Either he was a lunatic, and his life does not suggest the imbalance of the lunatics that are in psych wards and claim to be the son of God. His life evidences all the balance of a human being whom we respect and whom we regard as the ideal picture of a human being. Moreover, if we claim that he is a liar we are faced with the ethical impossibility of the foremost moral teacher whom all of us regard as offering the highest ethical standards that the world has ever seen. We're faced with that ethical high moral teacher lying about the central focal point of his whole life, his own identity. If we say that he was a liar when he said he was the son of the creator of the universe, he cannot be the highest ethical teacher and the highest moral example that the world has ever seen and yet still be a liar about the central point of his teaching. If we say, well, he's not a lunatic, he's not a liar, maybe he's just a legend. The problem with this is that though uh, Buddha uh, had the time between his death and the first recording of his life on paper, he provided the time for a legend to develop because the people were all dead who had remembered him when his life story was written. This man, Jesus, did not provide that time because it was barely 20 years after his death when the circumstances of his life were being read about in various groups of people in the then known world. And many of the eyewitnesses who observed his death and observed his rising from the dead were alive. And they could corroborate that evidence or they could contradict it. In fact, they corroborated it and they confirmed it. And so we're left with the situation that if this man is not a liar and if he was not a lunatic and if he is not a legend, then he must have been the son of the creator of the universe. He must be the unique son of the supreme being that made our world and that made our whole universe. And if that is the case, then at last we have someone who can tell us something about what life is about and what the meaning of life is and why you and I are here. And that's the kind of thing that we would like to discuss over these next weeks and months. Let's talk a little more about the meaning of life tomorrow.